it's kind of scary. And now, and we're seeing the repercussions of this. We're seeing, you know, epidemic levels of, like I said, childhood chronic illness. I mean, 75% of American adults are obese or overweight. Um, 50% up to oh, close to 50% of children are obese, obese and overweight. I mean, this was unheard of 50 years ago. I think people are starting to get fed up with it. I think especially moms of young children who are seeing this epidemic of childhood illness that we have never seen in the history of this country before and seeing that so much of the you know, disease that's coming out here that children are being faced with right now is literally due to so much of the food that we're consuming on a daily basis and, and the chemicals that are put in our cereals and the, and the pesticides sprayed all over our food supply. It's, it's, and I think moms are sick of it. You're watching a special edition of The Sean Spicer Show, Make America Healthy Again, a winning issue, brought to you by Just Thrive. All right, guys, finally, already exciting. I you normally look forward to the weekend, but as you guys know, big live show, Sunday night, 7 o'clock. Hit that notification button now. I couldn't believe the response that we got to the Road to 270 on Wednesday. Unbelievable. It has gotten so much attention. I love doing these things. As you know, we're going to do them every single Wednesday as we go forward. But I wanted to do this real live version Sunday night. We're going to do it at 7 o'clock. We're just going to focus on the battleground states, right? So we'll go Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Nevada, whatever. But the cool part is in each state, we're going to bring in people on the ground in those states to tell us what we need to know. Where's the early vote? Where's the registration? Trust me when I say this, that you will not see this anywhere else. You are not going to see just someone going through the map, which is something you don't see anywhere else. But to see this extent of where we're going to reach out to these folks, cross check the numbers with them, ask them about the trends, all that kind of stuff. Seven o'clock Sunday night, hit the notification button. Now, listen, the Patriots play at one o'clock, so there's not even a football problem. <laughs> I know not everyone agrees with that, but uh, seven o'clock should be a pretty safe time. And like I said, if, if as we head into these final weeks, you want to know what's really happening. There's a lot of people that are blowing smoke on both sides. These are the people on the ground that are saying, here's how many people we've registered. Here's what the early vote looks like. Here's what the trends in the polls look like. Um, we had Ashley Hayek on the show yesterday. And after the show, she was telling me some of the stuff that she's seeing in Michigan as they knock on these doors. It's really insightful. And those are the things that you're not going to see anywhere else on like a five minute hit that someone does on cable. So hit that notification button now. Interestingly though, uh, a lot of new polls have come out since we did Road to 270, and we've got Connor McGuire of uh, WPAI coming up. He is the managing partner, uh, money, managing director there. He's going to tell us what they're seeing. We're going to go over a lot of these polls with him, what we should be paying attention to, what trends, all that kind of stuff. But check this out. You know what I predicted the other day, right? 306 electoral votes, Trump takes all the blue wall. And I based it off data and trends. Well, Emerson came out with brand new polls. Check this out. Arizona. Trump up two. We called that for Trump. Pennsylvania, Trump up one. We called that for Trump. We said it would be tight. We said it would be close. Georgia, Trump up one. We put that in the light red category, right? North Carolina, Trump up one there. Michigan, dead tie. Now, I told you I think the trend is in Trump's direction, but this thing kind of bears it out. Wisconsin, dead tie. Same thing. Nevada, Harris up one. That tracks almost exactly what I said was going on. Now, I'm not a genius on this. I'm just spending a lot of time looking at the data and the trends, and that's what's what we're seeing. What issues are we missing? What should we be looking at? That's why I want to bring these folks in, because I want to know on the ground, how is no tax on tips or no tax on overtime playing in Nevada? We're going to hear from Chris Carr. He's one of the foremost experts on Nevada politics. He's going to tell us, is it actually playing? We're going to hear about the unions. What do they? Ha what's happening in Clark County, right? All of those things are important if you really want to know what to look for on election night. And one of the questions I'm going to ask every one of them is on election night, where should we be looking and when should we be looking, right? I remember in 2016, we were looking at North Carolina. We looked at Bro Broward County actually in Florida early and we're like, wow, if we're not getting shellac there, we we're never going to win it. But we were, we're holding our own and in Northern Virginia. And we knew that that meant somehow we were going to have a good night. So there's some issues and some places that we want to track. That's the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about on Sunday night. So hit that notification button. Now put it on your calendar that you got a reminder because I, I just, I'm telling you, you're not going to see it anywhere else. All right. Without further ado, I want to bring in Connor McGuire. He's the principal and managing director at WPA Intelligence, a leading pollster throughout the country. These guys are working in key races in the battleground states. Connor, 
Good to have you. Thanks for showing up. Great to be on, Spicer. All right. So let me just ask you this. One of the things that I see a lot right now is firms are putting out the national head-to-head -head without context. And I think it's important to look at where Trump was in a lot of these polls vis-a-vis -vis 2016, 2020 versus now. So what, what, what should we be looking at historically speaking? Absolutely. On most of these polls, and most pollsters do it, they include a retro ballot. So at the end of the poll in the demographics, they ask, how did you vote in 2020? And this is a really important factor. It helps us wait. It helps us understand how the electorate has moved. And one thing that we all should be looking at is Trump's overperformance from the 2020 ballot. We are seeing across the country in congressional districts, in statewide polling, in Pennsylvania, California, everywhere across the country, Trump is overperforming how people say they voted in 2020 by five to even 10 points. Okay, so so explain that, right? So does that mean if I say I voted for Trump in 2020 and I, what I'm still voting for him or I voted for Biden in 2020 and now I'm voting for Trump, what does it mean when you say that he's overperforming? It means that people that say they voted for Joe Biden and Democrats have changed their mind after the last three and a half years and are now voting for Trump again. They have come and it, back. Is that because they don't like Biden or they don't like Harris or both? So at first, when you look at polling from before Biden dropped out, his numbers were, were in the dumps, of course. Well, then we saw Harris become the nominee, excitement on the Dems shoot up, but then she didn't really do anything. And these voters, these people that move, they, they look for information. And they haven't gotten any reason to now vote for, for Harris. So they know that Donald Trump is number one issues that he is best on are the economy, on immigration, and that's what they're caring about. So they're seeing that Trump actually, life was better when Trump was president. They want that back. They want to go back to when Trump was in office, running the country, accessible, their families were in a better position, and they were going to vote that way. Jamal Simmons, who was the former spokeswoman for Kamala Harris as vice president, came out the other day publicly and said they should be concerned about black men. He's based out of Detroit. And he said they have an issue with black men in particular on the Dem side and obviously men in general. How much are you guys seeing that? We're seeing men in general, especially black men and Hispanic men moving strongly towards towards Trump. Now, it's going to be I believe it will be record support for a Republican uh, in a presidential election from both these both these groups, Hispanic men and black men. And it's something that Democrats need to pay attention. And you imagine Donald Trump, the person they say is such a horrible person. No, he's speaking to them. He actually has a message they care about. I, I love that though. For the media is like he's horrible for for minorities, people of color, for blacks, for and it's like the number keeps going higher and higher and higher. They they the thing that's so funny to me, Connor, and you tell me, but it's like the media believes that you need to cater to these people and treat them as a monolith. And what Trump does is said, nope, I'm not going to do that. And they are confounded by this climb that he has in the polls with these groups that they think can't possibly support him. Absolutely. We spent a lot of time looking at this back in 2016. We looked at what people care about in, in this idea that Hispanic people only care about their religion. Yes, they're very conservative voters, but guess what? People care about the same thing in times of, of trouble. Is the economy, is providing for their family, is securing, making sure that they can trust their neighborhood to let their kids go out and play. And the Democrats have not touched that one bit. President Trump has always talked about this, spoke to people what they actually care about, what affects them on their daily life. They're, every single day, people go out into this world and try to figure out how am I going to get through? How am I going to do a little bit better for my family? And that's what, that's what President Trump talks about. That's the message he has. So from a trend standpoint, I always say that in the last few weeks of a campaign, I want to be riding the wave into the beach rather than holding it back, right? So from a sports standpoint, you don't want to be playing prevent defense. You don't want to just be holding onto a lead, hoping that the clock runs out. You want to be surging on offense. Where do you think the race is right now, especially sort of in the battleground states? I think obviously this whole election, it's been Pennsylvania. That is where you can see the money is being dumped in. It's very expensive, a lot of noise going on, but recently, the polls that have come out in Michigan and Wisconsin have really changed my mind about those states. I'm looking at polling in Michigan. 
Uh, Trump is winning in tie with most polls of 18 to 34 year olds. Where the Democrats always say we got to get the young people out. They're split evenly. When it comes to the economy, Trump is 10 points above there in Michigan. Uh, and on democracy, the one thing protecting democracy, all the Democrats try to talk about, Trump is plus one on defending democracy in Michigan. He's plus 13 on that at 18 to 34 year olds. Things are moving why do you, in the right way. Why, why do you think that is? It's because the funny thing is, I have my, my reasons, but it's funny that they spend so much time talking about abortion and democracy. You would think that that would actually favor them, but why Why would you, Why? I don't know, I'm surprised by that. Yeah, I'm surprised by it too, but the point is people do obviously very much do care about democracy and many Republicans and conservatives really believe that Democrats are leading this country in the wrong direction. Yeah, 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 I, and, and I think that, that we're also smart enough. When someone says democracy is under attack and I go, but which party's trying to pull somebody off the ballot? Yeah. I, I don't have, a, I mean, they, they keep saying it, but I'm like, the, 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 it's, you know, as the media like to say, without evidence. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not a great message because it can, like you said, it can mean a lot to a lot of different people. And now in a, in maybe in a primary, that's a great message because you take your little piece of it that you care about. But in a general election, when you've got this country as split as it is and people that hold their beliefs as strong as they do, fighting for democracy means the democracy that you care about, that you know about, and you've trusted, and this country has trusted for over 200 years. But also, like, I mean, to me, democracy is at its core about voting, right? So we're sitting here talking about get out and vote, go do these things that are inherently democratic, and then saying, but it's under attack. It doesn't make sense, right? If Trump was preventing you from voting, I could get the argument. But on its face, it's sort of like saying to somebody, let's go to the all you can eat buffet and talk about the food crisis. It's like, what? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't pass the smell test. And, and, and one another thing that comes up quite a bit in verbatim when it comes about protecting democracy from the Republican side is securing the vote and making sure that we have true and fair elections. That is something that Republicans truly care about and truly understand how important is our sacred right to cast a ballot President, we want to make sure the ballots are counted for the people that, you know, deserve to vote, people that are citizens here, that in voter ID is a good thing. Um, how, how I keep hearing from folks when I ask them about early vote, voter registration, some really good numbers, right? I talked to Scott Pressler. He's going to join us Sunday night for our live episode at seven, seven o'clock. He's always got statistics. I put up a graph the other day about Lucerne County, Fayette County. All these where, where new registrations. When you guys look at these folks, how do you model them? What do you think of them? So that you hear people saying we've registered new voters. How does that affect a model and Trump? That's a great question. There's a lot of data going back over several years and several cycles of of this. You know, people that register to vote, how likely are they to actually cast a ballot in the year that they they register to vote? They're very likely. We've saw we've seen this in Texas and Pennsylvania and Florida. I mean. People that register in election year are very likely to vote. So we know that there's something to it. What we've been looking at in, in a lot of these states is looking at these people that are newly registered to vote this year, uh, newly registered to vote in the last year, or maybe people that are on the file that have not voted in a while. And we look at them and we say, okay, now let's take a look at the ballot and how they expect to turn out and who they're going to vote for. A lot of these zero or four voters, people with no vote history, new registrants, they're turning out, they are reporting that they're going to vote for Trump uh, up to two to one than, they're, than voting for Kamala Harris. There is a significant advantage of this voter registration. Yes, we're doing a great job registering voters, but the very nature of Donald Trump is still creating new Republican voters. After the third cycle in, he is still finding new people that want to take part in this process of voting and are voting for him. So does that mean when we look at a poll, that it's under potentially underrepresenting his support in a lot of these states. So that is something that we've been digging into quite a bit, and we're still on that journey of figuring this out exactly how under under reported it may be. And this could be something you know every cycle we see some major fault in public polling that we all look back and say, oh, we missed this one, or you know they missed this one. This could be a higher turnout for new voters could be a real game changer in states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan. It is something that could really, really affect the turnout. Okay, so 
I, I've seen a great numbers for Donald Trump when it comes to these groups, right? Like I said, I saw Pennsylvania. I've seen some numbers from Arizona in particular. And I, and I mean this in all seriousness, so don't laugh. But what, what about all these Taylor Swift voters that are registering to vote? I got to imagine if Taylor Swift is the reason you're registering to vote, you're probably not voting for Donald Trump. Is that a concern? You know, I think it'd be more of a concern if Taylor Swift um, was actually more engaged. I mean, you remember Rock the Vote when MTV right. came out with that. That was some that was a real, real massive effort. And still in polling, latest polling that's coming out out of these swing states, we are not seeing some massive jump in support in the 18 to 35 year old group for Harris. It just hasn't appeared yet. So while we need to make sure we are turning out every single conservative and Republican in that younger age group, and they're excited to vote, uh, we do need to make sure that um, that we keep an eye on that. I just haven't seen it really pop up yet. Okay. Um, you guys do a lot of polling in the battleground states for for down ballot, right? Yes. Senate and, and House or whatever. Um, I, I have said when I did my road to 270 that when we look at the Senate, which is crucial for Donald Trump to, to get his nominations through and to get his policies through, that we don't want a 50-50 or 51, right? So if you look at it, right, West Virginia gets his 50. I think Montana gets his 51. Yep. I think Ohio gets his 52. Now, the other day I said all three blue wall Senate, right? Eric Hovde, Wisconsin, uh, Mike Rogers in Michigan, and Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania pull it out over the top. It, am I nuts on that? So I don't think you're nuts. And, and <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah, Sean. So here's here's where I think on on Wisconsin is very much outspent there through the summer through the summer months, and now the the spending has evened out quite a bit. Republicans are spending Hovde spending. And that is what you're talking about, catching the wave on riding in, moving in the, that direction. I think the spending is coming in there at the right time that actually can make the difference. Um, over in Michigan, uh, Rogers trailing Trump, his kind of movement a little bit, but that can be a, you know, a rising tide raises all ships situation. So I don't think that's crazy at all. Uh, I think watching those trends are in a good, good position for just kind of a, a Republican comeback in the state, which is so needed for Michigan. So I think that's a, a probably very good situation, those two states. I like Ohio. So I don't think you're 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 crazy whatsoever. I think it's gonna be a good night um, if these trends continue. Do you agree that that like for example in Michigan and Wisconsin, and I think to some degree in Pennsylvania, Trump has to win for those guys to win, right? So Eric Hovde's not gonna run above Donald Trump and Mike Rogers not going to win run above Donald Trump, right? Or or is that dynamic possible? So it is interesting in in those states. Let's take Wisconsin for example. You know Wisconsin very well. You've got to work for votes there. People have been really trained to and really conditioned to this since you know the 2010 elections all through 2012 recall. Wisconsin voters really care about you spending time there and earning their votes. I um, asked Hillary Clinton about that, but. Uh, so seeing that movement there and showing Republicans are working hard in that state is is very positive. But I don't see a situation that Trump isn't leading the ticket in helping in helping pull people up. Um, and I think that's certainly what will be the case. Um, in most cases, you're not going to see down ballot tickets kind of lift up. Um, there are some rare situations where that does happen. But I think Trump is leading the way in both Michigan and Wisconsin for the Senate races. Is there a race? a House race, a Senate race, or a state that you would point us to for election night and say, I think that there's going to be a surprise here. You know, so certainly I'll say the uh, the California districts, the congressional districts in California and the Valley, uh, they're they're good districts. What they really are, they're, they're people that really don't like Democrats. They they hate Gavin Newsom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they really do. Those are some good, some good bellwether. If we, if Republicans pull out those, um, in I think they'll be a, a very good night. Of course, it's California, so we're not going to hear about that for another three weeks when they stop counting. Uh, but that's actually a good point. I mean, can you imagine how long we're going to wait to find out whether you know potentially how whether who controls the House of Representatives? It's it's going to be it's going to be forever. I mean, I think a lot of pathway goes through New York. I think some of the New York races are are good. I think there's been some bumps in the road. Uh, in New York, but I think we've got good places, you know, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to to one race, which I find very interesting, which I am working on is Connecticut's fifth. Uh, George see, uh, by the way, just to, you know, to to sound old, that's the old Gary Franks district, the old Chris Shays district. That's Greenwich, uh, Stanford, 
Darien, right? Yeah, the fifth. It's up. It goes yeah. up through um, up through Danbury. Up, yeah. Uh, um, so up through Danbury, the fifth congressional George Logan. Uh, Joanna Hayes is not a very like person. She's not really delivered for her district. Uh, there's a lot of anger there. And you've got people that are, it's good working class people that are looking for help and they're not getting that from Democrats. So if that breaks, um, if that breaks, it's a good, a lot of suburban moms, a lot of suburban area around yeah. Hartford uh, could be a real good, you know, interesting bellwether. If that breaks early, um, you know, for Republicans are going to have a very good night. Okay. I want to ask you my sort of uh, people who watch the show every night know that this has been my latest soapbox. I believe that the sleeper issue has been sort of wellness, big food, the, the RFK Tulsi Gabbard, Gabbard issue, right? Our, our friend Alex Clark who comes on the show all the time has made a tremendous podcast out of this, but like this idea that like we're, the government's not taking care of us, right? Processed foods, red dye, yellow dye, and that if somebody champions this issue, it will resonate well with, with I think moms in particular, but parents of all kinds and just generally, I, I think a lot of more people, but moms in particular. Do you guys think that, I mean, again, is this something that you see at all? Is this the sleeper issue? Is it one cycle away? What do you think? You know, and certainly self-reliance is, is very important to, you know, I think very for this country. And I think a lot of Republicans have already been on this and you can see, you can certainly see it growing and understanding that yes, the government, who wants the government to be taking care of them? Nobody, at least no one should be wanting the government to take care of them and they're not going to take care of you. And I think it's important that people, people do understand this. They want to work for themselves. They want to get themselves in better health. They want to get themselves living longer. That means they can take care of their kids better, their family better. They can enjoy time with them. I mean, I certainly see it as um, I do think there is a bit of a socioeconomic uh, break there that has not broken through yet, um, yeah. but, it, but it certainly can. No, and that's you just put your finger on something that I hadn't been thinking of. That's entirely right, right? These especially I don't want the government to get my involved in my life, but I don't want them to lie to me, right? No. And so when I eat something, I don't want the, uh, to think, okay, it's okay for me, because that's that's the thing. And when I realize what you can get in Europe and what you can't get here, I go, why is the government allowing this? I don't want them to nanny me. But I think that your point is probably the smartest one that I've heard on this, which is it it will break through. But right now, part of what they've done is allowed this cheap processed food to be more affordable to people who can't afford it. And in the Biden economy, that's a big deal, right? I think that's you, you've put your finger on something that really makes a lot of sense to me in terms of why it's not breaking through more. So uh, I, I, I think this is an added element to this issue that I hadn't fully thought of in the past. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a tough situation that that our current administration has put a lot of families in. And when they're given the choice of, you know, 400 calories for a meal or 1200 calories that can be provide sustenance for a whole day, you're going to go with the cheaper option. Right. And that's a problem. And that's especially in the Biden economy. Yep. All right, Connor, thank you for sharing your insights with us. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. All right. My thanks to Connor McGuire for a great conversation on the state of polling right now. Uh, again, we're doing a big show Sunday night. You want to hit that notification button seven o'clock then. But I want to delve down a little deeper and find out about this issue of wellness, why it's happening, whether it is resonating more than I think. I want to bring back our friend Tina Anderson from Just Thrive. You remember her from several episodes ago because this issue of wellness, I think there's something there. All right, without further ado, Tina Anderson of Just Thrive. All right, I want to welcome back in Tina Anderson, the founder of Just Thrive. Tina, thanks for being with us. I I loved our last conversation, and so I'm excited about this one as well. Well, thanks so much for having me, Sean. I loved our conversation too, and I'm excited to continue it. All right, well, I, I have been making this this issue of, of what, you know, for lack of a better word, big food. I, I think this is the sleeper campaign issue. I think it's something that resonates with women. I think it actually, I mean, it resonates with men too, obviously, because I'm talking about it. But I think for a lot of people, it's not a partisan thing. It's a, it's a good government thing. It's like, hey, we're going to protect you. And I think the more that people find out about it, they're appalled that the government's not doing enough. Do you think that that's, I mean, am I overstating this or do you really, because th I, I, I think that this could be a huge winning issue for whichever campaign latches on and tries to take it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think people are starting to get fed up with it. I think especially moms 
of young children who are seeing this epidemic of childhood illness that we have never seen in the history of this country before and seeing that so much of the you know disease that's coming out here that children are being faced with right now is literally due to so much of the food that we're consuming on a daily basis and and the chemicals that are put in our cereals and the and the pesticides sprayed all over our food supply it's it's and i think moms are sick of it and and it's just so exciting for me i have been preaching this for the last 11 years since we started our company i've been preaching this and preaching this and now it's finally getting some major traction out there because of people like rfk because of people like casey and callie means that are all over um you know spreading the message it's just it's it's so exciting to me to see this change starting to happen you know you said you've been championing this for a while what was the reaction when you first started bringing it up versus now? Yeah, you know, it, a lot of skepticism. You know, I right. think people have always thought the government's protecting me. They're protecting me. And and I think, you know, that is the way the government used to be. But we just see there's just so many special interests in there and and influencing our tax dollars and, and influencing our government agencies that are regulating our food supply, regulating our um you know, drug supply. And it's, it's, it's kind of scary. And now, and we're seeing the repercussions of this. We're seeing, you know, epidemic levels of, like I said, childhood chronic illness. I mean, 75% of American adults are obese or overweight. Um, 50% up to oh, close to 50% of children are obese, obese and overweight. I mean, this was unheard of 50 years ago. Yeah. I want to show you, there's a, there's a video, you mentioned RFK. He put this video out that showed, and they, they testified in front of Congress, but then he put this video out about cereals, which I found fascinating uh, because he showed the difference between a, Amer you know, a cereal, same cereal that you can buy here in the U.S. versus what it looks like in Europe. Let's take a look. This is what most Americans innocently put into their bodies these days and most alarmingly into the bodies of their children. And it's no coincidence that Americans die earlier than Canadians or Germans or Italians or Japanese or Koreans or Australians or most any other comparable country. And it wasn't always that way until the early 1990s, our life expectancy was the same or better than other developed countries. And then suddenly, more and more Americans began suffering from chronic diseases, from obesity, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, heart disease, and all kinds of autoimmune diseases, our maternal mortality rate soared to the highest of any developed country on earth. Same with infant mortality. Like the frog in the slowly boiling water, we didn't really notice as we got sicker and sicker. We've grown now to accept chronic disease conditions as normal. But now, in 2024, we're finally waking up to this cataclysm and we're asking ourselves, how in the world did this happen? A big part of it is our diet. Restaurants that serve contaminated food are fined or shut down. But when it's the government that approves the poisons in our food, a few people get very, very rich and the toxins end up in every supermarket aisle. Let me show you what I mean. Doritos, Cheez-Its, Cap'n Crunch, gummy bears. Everyone knows that these are junk foods, so maybe you wouldn't be too surprised to see that the ingredients include a lot of poisons, including a harmful yellow dye called tetrazine, or yellow dye number five. What you may not know is that this dye was originally made out of the sludge that's left over when you turn coal into coke for blast furnaces. It's called coal tar, and I've actually sued many big industries for legacy contamination of coal tar all around the country because it's so toxic and it's so harmful to the environment and human beings. A century ago, it was just an obnoxious industrial byproduct that everybody was trying to figure out ways to get rid of. One of the ways that they did that was by paving roads. But then a British chemist figured out that the coal tar could be used to derive fabric dye. And if fabric die, why not food? Food manufacturers began using it to cover up the discoloration of low quality foods that they wanted to pass off on unsuspecting customers. They didn't know back then that this yellow dye, tartrazine, causes tumors, asthma, developmental delays, neurological damage, ADD, ADHD, hormone disruption, gene damage, anxiety, depression, intestinal injuries well we know it now but i how, so when you look at something like that you said to yourself how does the government allow that we get told all the time by the fda and 
the CDC. I mean, do this, don't do that. Don't smoke, mm -hmm. right? Be careful how much alcohol you put in your body. And yet we're putting a chemical in our body that is a byproduct of tar. I mean, I, I to me, when I saw that, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, 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 yeah, unconscionable, really, that this has been allowed to happen. We have this outrage, you know, over COVID. We have this outrage over different things that, you know, our country's experiencing, but nobody's, but you don't see them outraged over the chemicals that are in our food that are causing so much illness and disease. I mean, we know that so many of these chemicals are literally causing our gut lining to be destroyed. And, and that is causing so much, it's really at the root cause of so many of these diseases that are out there that RFK mentioned. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. We see it every day well and you talked about this the first time that we ever talked about how much of this is connected right so it's not just oh i have an unhealthy gut so i'm bloating or an indigestion like that affects your mood your sleep your i mean like so much of this is interconnected that it's not just one thing it really does affect your health number one number two when you think about the statistics all of these other health things that are happening the consequences uh cancers uh other ailments that all are a byproduct in the last several years. The only connection is, wow, processed food. Right. Right. And, you know, the scary part is like, we all know like what processed foods are. Or most people know what processed foods are. You know, you see most of the um, food items that are found in the middle of the refrigerator or I'm sorry, the middle of the grocery store. And, you know, you, you could look at the ingredients and see all the ingredients that you can't pronounce. And those are generally considered processed foods. You know, you'll see them. But what's so scary is like with fruit, for example, the fr fruit is being sprayed with pesticides, they're being sprayed with other chemicals and they're not listed on the label. Like they are at least like in the middle of the part of this grocery store, you'll see what pesticides are in there or what, you know, chemicals are in there. But with fruit, you don't have that listing of all of the chemicals that are being sprayed on there to keep them looking beautiful. Well, no, and that's the important part, right? I want to eat healthy. I'm like, oh, I'll eat more fruit. And then you find out through these videos, I always joke, I think I told you this before, my wife thinks it's hysterical that I find out half of my health slash medical information now from Instagram. Mm -hmm. But you're right, but I can't go to this. They don't write on the supermarket, hey, this orange was sprayed with this pesticide, but someone on Instagram showing it to me and I'm like, okay. And now I know, but it's like, I thought, wow, I'm eating healthy. I'm eating an orange, I'm eating an apple. But you find out that, hey, guess what you're doing, right? I did this test the other day where I took these strawberries and put them in water. And I think it was baking soda and let them sit because mm -hmm. I'd seen it on Instagram. And all of a sudden I showed the water afterwards and it's disgusting what comes out yeah. because the baking soda, but I, I, that's what I don't get is that why are we not being told? Like I keep thinking, and this is where, again, I hate to link it back to politics, but we're, you know, less than we're about 20 days out from an election. I would want to know, Hey, this strawberry has stuff in it. Be careful when you put it in your body. Yeah. Well, big food and big pharma are influencing our government policy. That's what it comes down to. I mean, they are strongly influential and, you know, money talks and, and that's what's, I mean, even medical schools, you know, we know that big pharma is funding so much of medical schools and doctors are being influenced by this. And, you know, there's not, there aren't classes on nutrition or not a lot of classes. There's maybe one class on nutrition in medical schools. And so we're not talking about the food. We're not talking about the quality of the food. We're not talking about, you know, how food could actually be healed to us. Um, you know, people have thought it's just woo woo or it doesn't make sense, but really like food is medicine. And we've seen this over, you know, centuries and centuries of our, you know, evolution. I want to get to the doctor piece in a second, but you mentioned the pesticides, right? So what, what do we, what do you know about the effect of these pesticides on our health? Well, I know that the pesticides are actually wreaking havoc on our gut health. They are really, in my opinion, the cause of all of these chronic conditions that you had mentioned. You know, RFK would speak at a lot of autism conferences that we spoke at, and we would be talking about this all the time. We see this uprise in autism with children. I mean, there's a massive increase in autism with children right now because we know that it's affecting the gut lining. We know that when your gut is disrupted, we are causing so much of our disease. 70% of our immune system is found in our gut. So our ability to fight off these pathogens are found in our gut. So, you know, we're going to be faced with pathogens. That's what ha happens. But when we're disrupting our gut, it's it's really the, it's like the feeding ground for all of these other diseases. I mean, mental health issues, you know, we have mental health issues. 90% of our serotonin, which is our happy hormones produced in our gut. We have to be focusing on our gut when we're talking about overall health. Do you find that there's, you know, you mentioned the evolution 
of this issue over the last, say, 10, 15 years. When you say it's, there's a much more receptive audience now, is it just moms that you're talking to or is it elected officials as well? I think uh, it's a lot of the moms I'm talking to. I mean, obviously, I'm in the health and wellness space. I do feel like uh, Casey and Kelly Means have made a huge, you know, um, splash in this and really bringing awareness. Um, really well spoken, great, very oh, yeah. educated on the topic, and um, I and and they've collaborated with a lot of great health and wellness influencers out there that are, you know, taking their years and years of research and digging and spreading this message out to the masses. And it's just and it makes sense to people. That's what I think is. I think it's all making sense like why are we all so sick why when i when you and i were in school sean like we didn't know anybody who had a peanut allergy yeah, or no allergy. no one i didn't know a single person and then suddenly my kids go to school and they're like nothing can be like nothing and people are having not just an allergy a violent reaction Yes, violent, and, and we didn't see that years ago. And now it's like, what is going on? And it's it's really, it comes down to our gut. And all of these things that we're doing, our gut is so critical to like having a healthy life, being healthy. And yet we're living in this world with pesticides that are so disruptive to our gut, to antibiotics, to chemicals, to the food dyes. These, all of these chemicals and pesticides and herbicides are so disruptive to our gut. And that's why I believe we are seeing this uprise in chronic conditions. I mean. Cancer is at its highest level in young adults. It's it's so sad. You know, you mentioned the means, um, Casey and Callie. You turned mm -hmm. me on to to listening to them, and and I was listening. She she was a doctor, yeah. uh, like a Stanford trained doctor, and she's basically like, you know, to your point, this is how little we learn about nutrition in medical school. They learned to hyper hyper specialize, like in in. You know, she mentioned this one doctor who gets uh, the head of Stanford. I think is a yeah. is Vineyard. a ortho what do they call it oso ther i was like yeah. someone who just specializes in the ear uh in the in like surgical procedures and and yet she's like we don't learn about the whole body and this goes back to your point about the gut so much of of our issues are connected but we're seeing higher infertility lower life expectancy and higher cancer rates and we're all sitting around scratching our head like gosh what could that be mm -hmm. and it seems to me is that the one thing that has changed is our diet and what we're putting into our bodies in the last couple of decades. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the food is just so compromised. It's not fresh. Like we, you go to Europe and you don't. People don't experience a lot of these issues. Well, um, that's the, that's the, that's almost like the control group, right? If you think right. about an experiment, you're like, here's what we do in America. Here's everyone else. They're not getting sick. They're not facing these issues, and we are. Yeah, or Japan is another great example of just, you know, they're, they're not allowing, they, you know, we as a government, our society, we have to be protecting our children. That is our job, our duty to be to protecting our children. And, and we are not, I mean, we're, you know, marketing all of these horrible foods to our kids. And I, I think people are outraged. I have a daughter who just had a baby and she is so vigilant. These young moms are so vigilant now about trying to keep things clean. And I, I mean, not all moms can do it. And, but I think you're seeing this huge trend in this more natural, everyone wants to go back to the way we evolved, you know, in nature. And, and I, I think that's going to bring health back to this nation. You know, as a kid, you can tell for those watching the, the video portion of this, like I'm fair skin, right? I was a kid. I was growing up. I was always putting zinc on my face, right? Cause mm -hmm. I was out in the sun a lot and then sunscreen evolved. And based on a video I saw the other day, I asked my dermatologist, I said, Hey, She's always telling me you got to put sunscreen on all the time. You've got to have, cause you're fair skin and we like to zap stuff off your face. And so I said, Hey, by the way, I keep seeing these videos about how bad some sunscreens are. You know, I'd look on the side of the product and you know, there's these names. I don't know. And she goes, Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. I go, what do you mean? Wait, wait. Yeah. So you're telling me that the stuff I'm using to protect my skin is dangerous for other reasons. And she said, well, don't put stuff that has all these things on it. Right. And she starts reading off the ingredients and I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, those are the ones they sell you in the drugstore though. So yeah. it's, it's everything. I turn around and go, wait, I thought I was being healthy and smart and safe. And it turns out that I'm doing harm to myself in other ways. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's unbelievable. And that's what's so funny is like zinc is actually fine to do. Right. To put on. And now you, you know, we used to, you used to use zinc and now you're starting using all of these other chemicals and it's just, and, and you know, our skin is our largest organ of our body and, and yet we're slathering, I mean, little babies, we're putting all these chemicals on our babies and I mean, we don't want to have, you know, you definitely don't want to sunburn your skin and that's not good, but we, sun is good for us. Sun is so yeah, yeah. good for us. I mean, it's our source of vitamin D. It's, it's critical for us. So the funny thing is the other thing that I thought was interesting, right? I, I mentioned, you know, the evolution of this issue. You talked about it, right? The other day I'm looking on Instagram and a post comes up from CNN. I'll put it on the screen showing all of the, the kitchen utensils, you know, the spatula, et cetera, mm -hmm. that the thing I, I use all those things all the time. I love to, to cook, you know, omelets or whatever on the stove. And I realized that it says, oh, guess what? These things have forever chemicals in them. They're probably mm -hmm. harming you. And I'm thinking to myself again, between the nonstick stuff, the, the the forever chemicals, we're allowing ourselves to do this because this is permitted in the marketplace. Yeah, I know. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, I remember spending, I would, I mean, I was spending like hours and hours and hours like trying to research which um, cookware would be safe to cook with for my family. And it's like, you still don't have great answers out there. I mean, there's just so many chemicals that are just all over the place. And it's, it's very... I mean, it's discouraging in a lot of ways right. because you know what are we going to do if we don't find if we can't find clean food out there and clean cookware so what do you do what do you do? i mean how does if, if someone's hearing this and they're like god now i'm discouraged sean i keep hearing what tina's saying and I'm, I'm bummed out what are the steps that i or anyone could be taking right now to say how do i make my my health a little bit better yeah. Well, one of the things I like to focus on is resilience. We are going to be faced with chemicals. We're going to, I mean, in our lifetime, we're going to be faced with it. I mean, I, I'm hoping that the, you know, mission that Kelly and Casey and RFK have started is going to really change. I do believe that it's going to change our world and going to make our world a healthier place. But right now, I mean, it's going to take a while. So right now, what can we do? I, we want to build resilient bodies because we are going to be faced with these disruptors and pathogens and um, all these chemicals. So we want to be resilient. And one of the ways we start with that is focusing on our gut because our gut is, you know, we know our, we are 10 times more bacterial cells than we are human. And I think that's really hard for people to wrap their head around. We are actually 10 times more bacterial than we are human cells. And yet we're living in this world that's so antibacterial from antibacterial hand soaps, antibacterial um, hand sanitizers antibiotics in our food supply, chemicals and pesticides are, are wreaking havoc on our gut. So I would say to focus on your gut health and really try to make yourself as resilient when you're faced with these chemicals. Of course, we need to stay away from processed foods as much as possible, just eating whole real foods um, and, you know, cleaning your vegetables, trying to eat organic. And I know that's hard. And I know that people, you know, it's, it's expensive to do that, but you know, you could go to Costco, or you could go to Trader Joe's and find like frozen organic vegetables. And, and that is a little bit more cost-effective way to eat organic, but really trying to eat whole, clean, real foods, and then focusing on on your gut health because we yeah. know that our gut is where so much of our immune system is our neurotransmitters are produced there um it's really the it's the foundation for your health you know i when we first talked you started telling me about probiotics and the importance of that in our health and i was like oh great i take a probiotic like i a buddy of mine who i think is fairly health conscious in great shape a navy buddy of mine uh had recommended this one i'm like oh that's awesome and then i started hearing from you about how 90 percent of them actually don't get to where they're supposed to. And you're like, that's why we, you know, at Just Thrive have a probiotic that's completely medically tested. I've started taking both the, the probiotic one and the Just Calm, but why is it important to take a probiotic that actually, I mean, I know this sounds silly, but like for a lot of people, they, they hear it and they go, yeah, okay, I'll take a probiotic, but it's not getting to where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the biggest thing with a probiotic, the definition of a probiotic is a live microorganism when conferred in adequate amounts confers a benefit on the host, which is the body. So yeah. the key thing is that it's a live microorganism. The majority of probiotics on the market actually are killed off in the stomach acid. The stomach is meant to be the gastric barrier. It's very acidic. If you touched your finger on the stomach acid, it would burn your finger. It's very acidic. It's meant to be a protective mechanism to keep out pathogens. Well, the problem is in order to just be a probiotic, it needs to be a live microorganism in the intestines. The majority of probiotics 
don't even meet that first part of the definition. They actually die. So you're actually getting dead bacteria in the intestines. That's not really doing much. The spore-based probiotics that we deal with, that we work with, are um, actually have this endospore shell around itself that allows it to survive the gastric system. And this is naturally, this is not like we haven't engineered them or done any type of enteric coating or anything. These are the way these bacillus strains were found in the environment. And they have this endospore shell around it that allows it to survive the gastric system and get to the intestines alive. And that's when you see this true change in the microbial environment. And you start to see diversity in the microbial microbiome. Okay. Well, Tina, I mean, thank you for being with us. And by, and by the way, guys, like I, I told you, like, if you're going to take it, because you understand the importance of a healthy gut, take something that works, which is why I switched over to Just Thrive. And for what it's worth, Tina is continuing her offer that's been so kind to, to viewers of the show. So if you're interested, go to justthrivehealth.com. You get 20% off a 90-day supply of, of the probiotic or the Just Calm. And by the way, I talked to you before this, like, I love your gummy and I swear, cause I think it's like, I love anything that tastes like candy. That's yeah. My problem. That's, that, that's part <laughs> of my health problem. But you were reassured me the gummy is just as good as the other one, which thank God, because uh, I love it that much. But the 20% is for any of the probiotic products, including the gummies guys. So, uh, you know, take what you want, but I'm telling you the gummy is, <laughs> is a nice little <laughs> treat. Uh, so thank you for that offer. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You bet. All right, guys. Uh, as again, just real quick, if you're interested in doing something for your health, take a probiotic that actually works. Go to justthrivehealth.com. Uh, you get 20% off a 90-day supply. Make sure you're using uh, our promo code SPICER because that's the key thing right here. Uh, so go to justthrivehealth.com. You get 20% off a 90-day supply. That takes you in the next year. Uh, that's awesome. All right. I appreciate Tina being with us. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.